When I hear a song like that, it makes me ask the question, do I really mean the words I'm singing? I want nothing else but you, God. I'm not here for the blessings. I'm just here for you. If, by some chance, you lost everything tomorrow, would you be able to praise God? And we say amen. And we say yes when we're sitting in a temperature-controlled room in somewhat comfortable seats. (laughs) And we say yes. Because there's really, for many of us, no risk of losing anything tomorrow. And then I have to ask myself, God, do I want more of you? Do I really want your presence? Do I really mean the words when I sing those songs? And that song, I'm like, that just wrecks me every time I hear it. And I'm like, they're singing that before I preach. (laughs) It just wrecks me. Because I have to think about it. And it convicts me. Because so many times I come to God for what He gives me. I come to God with my agendas. I come to God with what I need Him to do. And it's not for Him. That's just me being honest. They may never ask me to come preach again because I'm being too honest. But it's just where I'm at. And, and it's just amazing. I just wanted us to, before we jumped into the sermon, for us to just think about the weight of what we just heard. And what we just prayed and sang to God. We want more of you, God. What if more of God meant sacrifice on our part? What if more, more of God meant that we say no to some things that we have routinely be, have been saying yes to. It's just a question. And it, it's just something that I want us to think about tonight before we jump into this sermon. That was not my planned introduction. That's not a good introduction to bring such a heavy topic at the beginning of it. But I'm just telling you, it just was so important for me to say that. So tonight... Yes, it is a 10-point sermon, but I promise you that we will have enough time to get you working on the project that I need you for. (laughs) That's why they have me preaching. (laughs) They want to make sure that we get done enough time to pack 2,600 bags. Um, But as we walk through tonight, we're walking into uh, really just a passage. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 146. And I I love tonight... Yes, we're in the fellowship hall and we're worshiping and we're serving God right after this. And I think it's just an important night in the life of our church. Because what we're doing tonight is we're, be, we're going to open up God's Word and we're going to see who He is. And then we're going to be able to go and serve Him. And I think it's just a unique opportunity that we don't always get to see and happen at church. Can you believe it's already Thanksgiving. I'm just telling you, 2019, it seemed like yesterday we were ringing in the new year, and here we are getting ready to close it out. And as we walk through, this time next year, or this time next week, you will all be confessing of gluttony, right? You're going to be walking through, and you're going to be regretting everything that you did over this past weekend, and you're going to feel bad about it. And then you're just going to walk through, and it's just, then that's just the beginning, isn't it? I don't know about your family. But here it is, life in my family, it is just crazy all the time. And when it comes times for the holidays, it's even crazier. My family, and my wife is here, and I'm sorry, but we don't, we don't thrive during the holidays. We're just praying to God that we survive, <laughs> right? Three young children all going different places, doing different things with parties and church obligations and all that kind of stuff. We just want to survive the holidays and be able to walk through and just see in the midst of it time with our family. And you're going to walk in and you're going to, you're going to just walk through these next six weeks and they're going to be over just like that. And then we start all over again. It's chaos. The holiday season, in many ways, is chaos. Not only is it a glorious time for us to celebrate and just just glory in all that God has given us over this past year, but many times it's a stressful time. 
because you are forced to be around the people that you know you have to love. Your family. Right? Yeah. The people you hang around the other times of the year, that's who you choose to hang around with. But tonight, or the holidays, you hang around with those people that you have to hang around with. That's just the way it is. And it causes stress. Well, what are we going to do when Uncle Joe meets up with Aunt Susie and you know they're going to get in a fight? What are we going to do? You just walk through those things. And they can be stressful. Can I get a witness? Or is this just my family? I mean, it's just the way it is. And so we just walk through that. And in the midst of this chaos, we have a tendency to lose the significance of the moments that we're walking through. We just lose them. Because even though the holidays, we say that Jesus is the reason for the season, but many times it gets turned and so self-focused. Yeah, we're praising God all the way through it, but in many times we're trying to serve our needs, our wants, our pleasures instead of His. And tonight, you're in luck because I'm getting ready to give you a pep talk. This is an encouraging sermon, I hope and pray, (laughs) that you walk away tonight encouraged before you enter into this craziness that is the holiday season. You walk, I want you to walk away and just, just glorying in the presence of God. Because in this text that we see tonight, we see God. The title of the sermon is Praise the Lord While You Can. Praise the Lord While You Can. And it's an interesting title and it comes straight from the text. Look at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. The book of Psalms we know is many ways a songbook. For the Hebrews, they listened to and they would listen and and sing these songs, memorize them corporately and as a family. And you can use these individually for individual worship. Listen, that praise the Lord in verse 1. It's a call to worship to the congregation. Praise the Lord. And then it turns it, the next phrase, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It brings it individually. Do you realize that you can be participating in corporate worship and missing it yourself? Just because you're in this room does not mean that you're worshiping. And so, yes, praise the Lord. But praise the Lord, oh, my soul, brings it to us individually. Simple question tonight is, are you worshiping God tonight? Praise the Lord while you can. Why? Because he says, while I live, I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. There's going to come... A time in your life, in the life of a believer, where your praise, it will stop here on earth. Because you will cease to exist here on this earth, in your body. We know that we have glory and hope in, for eternal salvation. But there's a change that happens. And what the psalmist is saying right here, praise the Lord while you can, while you live While you have your being. And that's tonight. Tonight, my hope and prayer is that we will be able to look at and dive into the text and see ten reasons why why we can praise the Lord. And we need to know this. I'm going to just be honest with you. This is a simple message from a simple guy. There's no theological revelations that I'm going to bring to you tonight that you haven't heard before. But here's why. We need to be reminded of the simple things in Scripture Because we lose the simple things in the midst of our busyness. And when we focus on those simple things and see God for who He is, it causes us to praise Him. So we want to walk in tonight and figure and see ten reasons why we can praise the Lord. And let's just start. Praise the Lord while you can because you cannot put all your trust in people. Look at verse 3. It says, do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and in that very day, his thoughts perish. Talk about a sobering thought. We walk through life, and then we die. In the moment that we die, it says, his thoughts perish from the earth. His spirit departs. See, we love putting our trust in men, 
and women that we, lo- that we love and hold dear, in our family members, in our, our mentors. We look towards men, right, and women, and we follow them in so many ways. But what Paul, what the a psalmist is saying here, it says, do not trust in princes. In many ways, do not trust in governments. Do not uh, trust in those institutions that man began. It says, in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. There is nobody... In this room, nobody that you know and love that you have ever met that has ever lived on this earth besides Jesus Christ that died to save you. If you're trusting in anyone else for your salvation, you are trusting in the wrong thing. But there's so many times that we walk through life and we put all of our stock in men and women. And when they fail, it hurts our faith. You know why? Because we are putting our attention on somebody that is fault, that is faulty. There, has anybody ever met a perfect person? My wife just raised her hand. She's right back there. Thank you, babe. Yeah. Yeah, there is nobody perfect. There is nobody perfect. And what happens when we fail somebody, we let them down, it, it hurts that other person. We walk through life. And I bet over your lifetime, you can think of individuals that you look to, towards for spiritual discernment and spiritual leadership, and they have failed you. You are probably thinking of somebody right now. This scripture says, don't put your trust in people, because they will fail you. In the wisdom of men that is not founded in scripture, it will fail you. Trust in the Lord, not in your own understanding or other people. So we cannot put our trust in people. We just can't do it. And so when we're looking at reasons why we should praise the Lord, we should praise the Lord because men will fail us, but God will not. Second reason is this. We must praise the Lord while we can because God is your help. Look at verse 5. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is is in the Lord his God. How blessed, how happy is he whose help is is the God of Jacob. When we talk about this idea of help, somebody that is with you at all times, that even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil because He is with us. We can praise God because He is our help. Now, unless you've ever really needed to rely on God and nobody else, you don't understand this verse. But when you think about the children of Israel, when they're walking through 40 years in the wilderness, they were dependent upon God for their food every day. They were dependent upon God for every step they took. In the day, there was a pillar of cloud. At night, there was a pillar of flower, a fire. And when they moved, when it moved, they moved. They were dependent upon God for every aspect of their life. So when they were able to sing this, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, they were able to really understand where their help came from. See, we live in a culture that is so wrapped up in providing for ourselves, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and saying, we got this, that we only turn to God when we have no other choice. We only turn to him when there is no other option, and he is our plan Z normally. It's almost like this. When all else fails, let me pray about it. Right? It's just the way that it happens. We walk through life in this church, and we have individuals that come in all the time that have legitimate needs in their lives. And so many times, it's at that last moment, right before all else fails around them, that they actually ask for help. And we try to help, but sometimes we can't because it's too late. But listen, you don't have to wait. You have a God who is near you and wants to help you. See, you can praise God tonight because you can trust that He is going to help you. He is going to help you when you call on Him. He is going to help you in your time of need. Also in verse 5, we see, we see the third reason. It says, God is your hope. God is your hope. He says, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. Now, this word hope, if you just look it up in the dictionary, it means to desire with expectation of attainment and fulfillment. We have hope 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is that? I mean, here at church, Sunday night crowd, you hear me say that and you're like, amen. I get that, right? Okay, no, we don't get it. Okay, good. This is good. I'm talking to people that need it. We think that we get it and we say words. Just roll it off the tip of our tongue and we know it and we say, man, I have all my hope in Jesus Christ. But what does that really mean? What it means is that we believe that Jesus is going to fulfill all the promises that are written in his scriptures. We have a hope that one day that we will live eternally with him. We have a hope that one day he will come back and take, for his, take up his children to be with him for eternity. That's the hope that we have. We hope with this desire, that this ex- expectation that what he says in his scripture will take place. What are you hoping in tonight? Are you truly resting in the promises of Scripture? Are you really putting all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Or is your hope in yourself? Or somebody else in your life? See, I love this. God is your hope. You don't have to worry about tomorrow because you have a hope that God will fulfill everything He has promised you. Can we praise God tonight? Amen. Amen. Praise God because God is our hope. But not only is is He our hope, God is your creator. Look in verse 6. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. And we need to hear this. Everybody look up at me. I'm going to tell you something that you've never heard before. God made you. He made you, now get this, with intentionality. Growing up, my mom used to say, oh, you weren't an accident, you were a surprise. Right? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Is there any other surprises in the room? All right? And so, so I came into being not by a plan, but because I was a surprise to my parents. Get this. I'm just going to come down on your level. The camera person is going to hate me. I'm sorry. God made you intentionally. He created you in such a way that he knows the very hair on your heads. He knows the struggles and the trials that you're going through. He made you. And not only did he create you, he created a world. A world that we get to enjoy. That we can see his presence as you walk through the steps. And see, we worry and we think, man, I don't have anything to praise God about. My world is falling apart, but yet he made us with such intentionality that he loved us so much that he died for us. If the devil in here, if there's anyone in here tonight, and the devil is feeding you this lie that you are less than, that you are not good enough, I need you to rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ. Why is it? It's because of this truth. Not only did he create the sea, he created you and he created you with intentionality. And he wants you to be his child for his kingdom and for his glory. That's why we can praise the Lord. We can praise the Lord because he created us. Sorry, camera guy. All right. I'll try not to do that again. I need a bigger bigger walking area. God is your creator. And in the last part of verse 6, it's so simple but so profound. God is faithful. It says, who keeps faith forever? He is faithful. That word faith is truth. It it has its intentionality of this idea of stability. Firmness. That's what it means. He keeps that stable, firm truth forever. Forever. It is not anything that fades away with God. What he says today, he means tomorrow and forevermore. He is faithful. How do you know God is faithful? Well, in this very season where we start thinking about Thanksgiving, we start looking back and you could have had the worst year of your life. But I guarantee you, if you really focused on God and his presence in your life, You could see his blessings. 
I walk through Scripture and I see people that have nothing to praise God for, but yet they praise God. I think about Paul and Silas in the prison, just having been beaten and probably expecting death the next day. In the midnight hour, what do you find them doing? Praising the Lord. Singing praises to Him. I think of Paul and other aspects of his life when he's enduring shipwrecks and beatings and stonings and all of those things, and yet he still pursued Christ. I think of Job and all that he lost and all that he went through, but yet his faith in God remained. God is faithful. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And you need to hear that tonight. But not only is God faithful... God is also just. Look at verse 7. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, and he's, the Lord sets the prisoners free. You look at verse 7, it says, who executes justice for the oppressed. And look down in verse 9. It says, the Lord protects the strangers, he supports the fatherless and the widow, and he thwarts the way of the wicked. Those that have no one to speak up for them, He is there for them. And He is just. When we think about just, this is a great picture of God's characteristic. He is all love. Jeremiah says that He loves us with an everlasting love. That in 1 John says that God is love. But yet, the same scripture in Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7 says, He will by no means allow the guilty to go unpunished. That's justice. Perfect love and perfect justice coming together in God. He is there for the oppressed. And so when we feel like we are being wrongly persecuted and we're walking through trials and tribulations, we need to know that God is just and vengeance is His, not ours. You need to hear this tonight. God is just. He is just. You also see... That God is your provider. Verse 7, it says, Who gives food to the hungry? Who gives food to the hungry? And we think about this, you know, you think about in the Old Testament culture, so many, so many things revolved around the crops and all that was harvested and everything that was a part of all that they would do. You think about the story of Ruth and Boaz and, and how the poor would be able to go in and glean from the fields. Where if there was a bad crop, there would be less to, gre- uh, to glean. And so it was such this struggle sometimes between nature and what God would, would uh, pr- help provide for them. And when they would just praise God for what he gave to him. And he says in here, he says that he gives food to the hungry. Food to the hungry. He gives food to you. He gives food to me. He is your provider. In our context today, we see so much of what he has given us. And it's not just food, it's material possessions. We look at this room. We look at our homes. We look at the things that we do and we, we drive and all of that. Can you testify tonight that God has provided for you? Can we sing praises to God because we know that He is a provider? But not only is our, He our provider, He is our redeemer. Number eight, God is your redeemer. And I love this. The Lord sets the prisoners free. He sets the prisoners free. And this is... Uh, Both, I believe, just this idea of spiritual redemption. We are all held captive by our sins. And in the midst of that, when we find Christ, He sets us free. That's what we're talking about, Him being our Redeemer. Now tonight, we're going to pack 2,600 bags that are going to go to men and women in prison. They are in prison. But yet... Through some of the things that are in this bag, they could be set free. See, your captivity is not based on where you're at. It's based on your heart and what you're doing with Christ. And you may be here tonight and you may say, Ben, I'm I'm free from my sin. But you may be held captive by strongholds in your life that you have not given to God. See, I believe one of the ways that the enemy attacks believers today is keeping them tied up in the strongholds of their past so that they don't have full victory over in their present. 
Because when we have full victory over those strongholds, we're able to overcome and be able to be, have a greater impact for the kingdom of God. So do you need to be set free tonight? If you do, listen to this truth. God is your redeemer. But God is also your healer. It says, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. God is your healer. He heals us spiritually. He heals us physically. He is your healer. I want you to think about that. And for those of you that are walking through sickness or you have loved ones that are walking through sickness and there may seem like there is no hope, you need to hear this. If you're a believer, even if your life ends today, you're completely healed in the presence of God. See, so many times we miss it, understanding that in Christ we are already healed. He has healed you physically, spiritually, and we're going to see great and mighty things in the next life. God is your healer. And then number 10... God is your eternal king. Verse 10 says, The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is your eternal king. It is easy to praise God when you realize He's in control. And you stop trying to be in control of your life and let Him reign in your life. See, the struggles that most believers have, I believe, is they're too busy doing God's work in their own life because they think the only way is their way. And sometimes you just got to do this old thing. It's called let go and let let God. It's simple, right? But so difficult to do. And it just overwhelms me when I look at this fact as we're getting ready to walk into this season of life where it's just pure craziness. We need to praise God. And in his word, we see ten reasons. We cannot put all of our trust in people. God is our help. God is our hope. God is our creator. He is faithful. He is just. He is our provider. He is our redeemer. He is our healer. And he is our eternal king. Can I get a witness in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. It's good. It's okay to praise God. Praise the Lord while you can. Because one day you're going to die. And if you don't have, you're not, your life is not right with Him, you may never be able to praise Him again. Now listen, here's what's the awesome, here's the last point. I'm saving the best thing for last and I'm closing. There's things that can happen in your praises while you're alive that can't happen when you go into eternity. When you're around your family, I'm going to come down here with you again. When you're around your family, These holidays, when you praise the Lord, you're given testimony of His faithfulness in your life. There's some family members that when I start, if I start talking about the gospel, they cut me off. But they can't stop me from praising Him for what He's done for me in my life. You get it? Now here's the thing. When you die, you lose that opportunity. So when I say praise the Lord while you can, because there may be somebody here this year that won't be here next year. And you're going to lose that opportunity to praise God in their presence so that they can know that He has been faithful to you. So praise the Lord while you can. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we come to a time of invitation. It's a real simple message. Each one of these points could be a whole sermon, and I know that, and I know that in many ways we could go further into this message. But the simple truth is this, that we must praise God. And as you walk through this time, I'm going to ask our pastors, they can go ahead and stand up and come to the the front. Um, And Everybody, let's just go ahead and stand up. And we're going to just have a time of song. But I want you to think about this. 
Is there somebody in your family, in your friends, in your close circles of influence that need to hear you praise him more? Get that person in your mind and see how you can begin to praise him in their presence. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, the holidays are the worst time of my life of the year for me. I hate them. I don't want to enjoy them. It's just difficult because of all the things that have taken place in my life. I'm going to ask you to come down and speak to one of our pastors and just allow them to bear that burden with you. And you may be here tonight and you say, Ben, I can't praise the Lord because I'm not a child of God. Tonight, you need to see Him and experience Him as your Redeemer. You need to put your faith and your trust In the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you need to do that, come and take one of our pastors by the hand and say, I need Jesus to be my redeemer. If you're here tonight and you have some special need in your life, some special prayer in your life, come down and let us share that with you. Father God, we just thank you and we love you and give you all honor, praise, and glory. We praise you tonight, Lord. And I pray now that tonight people will do business with you. Lord, give us what we need to be a praise, a praising people. And we thank you and we love you. In your name I pray.